Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning, Bob. How are you? I'm having my coffee. I'm good. I will mute.
Yummy. Heard you. I can hear you. Ooh, thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. <laughs> Please mute. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. 
So everyone feel free to join the Jabber room and uh, ensure you write your name in the uh, blue sheet, which is on the etherpad. If you can get all that working before we start in five minutes time. Hi there.
Good morning. I think we'll get started now. Uh, welcome to the six man working group virtual intern. We, we're not sure if this is IETF 107, but um, since we didn't have a session at IETF 107, I think we will start. Assume you can hear me okay. We can hear you. Okay, good. Yeah, so I think we're going to try allowing the speakers to turn on their video um, in addition to the slides. We'll see how that works. If that that's causing problems for people. We can stop doing that. Um, okay, Oli, next slide. Right. So these uh, are, are sort of virtual meeting notes uh, taken from the, um, the, the rules that ISG gave us. Um, this is the first of, uh, we had scheduled two sessions at the IETF 107, but we'll see if there will be, uh, we have just scheduled one now, we'll see you know, from the experience here if there's interest in, in doing the other one as a virtual one as well. Um, to get into the microphone queue, we just put the plus queue into the WebEx chat, uh, minus Q if you want to remove yourself. And that's the only thing that a WebEx chat should be used for. Everything else goes into the into the Jabber room. Um, I don't think we will do any hums or consensus taking on the mailing list. Of course, we'll have discussion and, and bring all the calls to the mailing list after this uh, meeting. Uh, please mute your phones when you're not uh, speaking. Um, uh, remember to state your full name when you are speaking. The blue sheets go on to the etherpad. The link is on the presentation there. It's also on the agenda um, agenda in the data tracker, as well as all the materials if you want to see uh, directly for yourself. Um, so I think th this is the first interim meeting we have in about 20 years. Um, the last one was in Grenoble, if I remember correctly. Isn't that right, Bob? I think that's about right, though. It's the first time we've done a virtual, you know, one. The previous ones were all face to face. That's right. And so the note well applies as, uh, as it always does on ITF meetings. We have the Jabber room. Uh, I see not everyone is on it. It's very useful to be on it for, for this meeting, I think. So please join that if you're able to. Um, Barbara is taking notes for us. Um, Joel Halpen is doing Jabber scribing. And the presentation link is there. And again, please sign the blue sheets. Bob. Yes, I will go through the agenda. Um, we're doing the introduction. Um, Jen is doing a talk on, uh, I mean, we're first doing the working group drafts and then um, for active internet drafts. Um, we're going to go through Jen's um, creating neighbor cache entries on first up routers. Um, we're going, Fernando is presenting the, the, the BIS document for privacy extensions. Uh, this has been um, in working group last call and we're hoping to get to the point of closing that out. Um, then there's also the operations and maintenance and segment routing draft that's also been working with last call. And then we have um, four individual drafts, um, the alternate marking extension header draft, the transmission over multi-link network interfaces that Fred is presenting. Um, improve robustness of stateless auto configuration by Fernando and then also a problem statement regarding IP address uses also by Fernando. Any questions? Okay, Oli, do you want to do the next one? Yes, and that's the uh, document status. Uh, so since the last ITF, we have published one RFC. Um, that was a bit long in the tooth, so glad to get that one out the door. That's RFC 8754. 
which is the segment routing header for IPv6. We have two documents in the RFC editor queue. It's the ICMP limits document and the PREP64 in RA document. Um, Suresh uh, was very good at cleaning off his uh, backlog before handing the baton over to our new AD, Eric Klein. So welcome, Eric. Um, so there's nothing submitted to the ISG, nor there, is there anything in the ITF last call. Um, we have two documents in working group last call, uh, both on the agenda today. It's the uh, privacy extensions document, uh, RFC 4941-BIS. Um, and it's the OAM for segment routing uh, document. I will also have two working group documents currently. It's the path empty hop by hop option, which is not on the agenda, and it's the gratuitous neighbor discovery, uh, which is on the agenda. Um, yes, I think that's all from the chairs. Um, it's just a reminder of the new document format we have. Uh, also pointers to the uh, GitHub experiment we're running. With regards to that GitHub um, experiment, we should, you know, there's probably something we can discuss a little bit more on the on the mailing list now that we have gathered a little bit more information on it. Um, so I think the next one in the queue is uh, Jen. Do you want to come up and stand in the pink box, please? <laughs> I'm actually standing in the pink box. I am in the pink box. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly fine. Oh, great. So, good morning. So, creating neighbor cache in the first hop routers. I am quite sure everyone has read the draft, but just in case. Next slide, please. So, quick recap, in case you have forgotten about uh, what this draft is about, actually. So, the problem statement. When hosts start sending traffic from a new address, the traffic arrives to a router, maybe it's the same router, maybe actually another one, if you have multiple routers. That router might not have a neighbor cache entry for that address. And while the router is doing address resolution, all packets except the first one are usually dropped, which is kind of Upsetting. So the proposed solution is hosts could advertise the addresses using unsolicited NAs because apparently it's what neighbor advertisements are for. And routers might create a stale entry when they receive an unsolicited NA and there is no cache entry for that address. Next slide, please. Uh, what actually changed since last ITF when the draft was adopted? Next slide, please. So, not many changes actually. Uh, thanks for everyone who commented. Uh, some clarification text uh, was added regarding a, a destination address of such an unsolicited NAs. The current proposal is to send such NAs to all routers multicast address. The reason is, first of all, it would allow the packet to reach all routers on link, because in many scenarios, you might have multiple routers, for example, first hop redundancy, where P between them, so a router the host is usually sending traffic to a might not be in the router, the return flow are uh, going through. So uh, Mark uh, Smith made a very good comment, which I added to the text that actually not increasing the multicast level significantly by doing this, because we basically are making host to send one list at an A instead of a router sending multicast in SS to a list of multicast address to do address resolution. So basically, we're replacing one multicast packet with another. Also, if the network happened to have MLD snooping configured, it's even reducing the multicast noise because uh, such packets will be only sent to routers, not to all hosts only. Next slide, please. Uh, Mark 
also suggested that hosts might use uh, RFC 68 and send IPv6 multicast packet as a unicast Ethernet packet, uh, rep stating destination address for to the router MAC address. Uh, I am not sure it's a good recommended at least solution because again it might mean not all routers would receive that packet because in this case we basically rely on the host to know about every single router on the link so it kind of introduces a race condition here uh, and as a result asymmetric uh, traffic case might not be covered because if, if host is using router A to send traffic and it would send uh, such an unsolicited NA to that router, the return traffic going through another router might not be covered. Next slide, please. And the most interesting case, actually discussing potential disruptions. So I spent some time trying to uh, look into how the proposed mechanism might break something, especially in case of optimistic duplicate address detection, because in this case, basically, a host might start sending traffic and sending consolidated DNAs from an address which potentially might be a duplicated one. Next slide, please. Uh, so, first of all, if entry already exists on a router in any state except incomplete, no changes, right? The, it will be unsolicited DNA with override a flag set to zero, solicited flag set to zero, so any existing entry will not be updated. So what's happened if the entry is an incomplete state? So it basically means that there is a rightful owner which is on the network just sending traffic, return traffic just arrives, and another host, let's say host B, joins the network and starts sending consolidated DNAs before uh, that has completed. So would it cause any disruption? Next. So what's happened normally, right, before we implement the proposed mechanism? So it will, the statement draft uh, explains, we have a kind of packet loss for period between the first packet arrives to the router and the router receives a solicited NA from a address owner. Next slide, please. So if we, if the host with duplicated address starts sending consolidated NAs and router updates neighbor cache entry, what happens? During the time, a new entry might be created until the rightful owner responds to a name. Right? In this case, uh, the entry will be updated with the rightful owner MAC address, sets to read. Basically, I do not see how traffic can be interrupted, so no changes here. That's a good news. I have not actually updated the text in the draft, but I think this scenario might be clarified a bit more, so it will be in zero one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, to summarize, the incomplete and uh, no changes, the traffic will be restored as soon as the rightful owner responds with uh, solicited NA. Next slide, please. The most interesting corner case is what happened if there is no end, any disruption happens here. So after a discussion on the mailing list with Pascal, I realized yeah, it's with the draft probably needs to be clarified. And this is actually a corner case I'd like with the group. So uh, what happened if there's a rightful owner, let's say host A, which has an address, but it hasn't been sending any or receiving it, any traffic through the router, so router doesn't have any cache entry for that address. And that host just wakes up and starts sending and receiving traffic exactly in the same moment as another host uh, came and configured the same address in optimistic state. Next slide, please. So, without unsolicited NAs creating any entries on the router, right? 
what happened here. Uh, router sends multicast to NES. It's a basically moments when router start dropping traffic. All uh, packets arriving to the address A. And it creates an incomplete entry. Uh, if we have two hosts with the same address, uh, one of them in an optimistic state, both hosts would respond. And even if the host B responded first, and it would create a reachable entry in the router. As soon as rightful owner responds, uh, the entry will be updated, and the because that uh, NA would have uh, over override flux set to one, and from that moment of time, the connectivity is restored. Right, so it's a normal behavior how it happens now. Next slide, please. Uh, so now everything might become slightly complicated. So let's say unsolicited NA managed to arrive before the first packet arrives to the router. In this case, the stale entry will be created. And if that fails during the delay phase, because as soon as uh, packet receive, uh, pa uh, the first packet arrives to the router and the router is trying to send traffic, the entry will move to delay state. Because that would normally detect the failure in one second, right? We can expect that that failure will happen during the delay state, right? In this case, the worst, in worst case scenario, router will first send unicast NS, would not get any response from host B, then it will switch to sending multicast NS. And from moment the multicast NS is sent, we basically go in back to the original scenario. So next slide, please. The worst case scenario might be that a right phone owner might experience delay up to eight seconds. Again, if two events happen at the same time, the owner has not been receiving any traffic through the router, so there is no cache entry and duplicate address happened just before the traffic arrives to the router. Uh, by the way, I have a question to the audience. Do we know if any router implementations actually using the data plane traffic to move entry from delay to reachable? Next slide, please. Uh, because in this case, it's actually quite bad scenario, probably, if the entry got into reachable state, that obviously the delay will be much longer to re re restore the connectivity. But I have not seen routers actually doing this. My, my impression is they do not actually normally watch for data plane traffic. So I'm not sure, like, is that corner case bad enough so we should not be doing this? Or it's way too many things happening at the same time, the probability is quite low. So I think, uh, next slide, please. I think that's all I have. So yes, yeah, I said, I think there is one scenario when proposed mechanism might make situation worse, but on the other hand, it's a quite a, a lot of things happening at the same time. So, yeah, so. Done. So is there any questions uh, for Jen? Seemed like a very quiet room. Um, so we discussed this draft both on the mailing list and in the last IDF, and I think, um, and Bob and I have spoken about it, and I think the plan was to, to take this fairly quickly through the, through the working group. Um, so as far as we see it, uh, we believe this is ready for a working group last call. Um, are there any objections to that? Do any, anyone see any problems taking this draft uh, fairly quickly into working group last call? And if, if you have a question, just put a plus Q into the WebEx chat uh, window. Uh, uh, Ule, uh, one comment. So uh, we have basically two drafts, right? One is problem statement. One uh, which is in V6 Ops, and another one is this one. So I 
not sure, but I think maybe it makes sense to have the joint last call for both of them because honestly, a friend didn't go for the last call for problem statement draft in V6 ops until we go into the last call with this one because let's say we decide that this solution is not good enough, right? So there's a problem statement draft which actually talks about various solutions and proposed one in particular might need to be changed. So what do you think? Well, we could certainly last call them together. I mean, well, yeah, I guess typically the problem statement would get go before the the solution document. Um, I believe we discussed as well if it was necessary to to actually publish the problem statement. Um, but um, I, I mean, we can certainly talk to the V6 ops chairs to see if we can coordinate the, a working group last call. Uh, because basically, uh, what's happening? Uh, pro problem statement draft discusses various approaches to the problem. Right? We can pick the router, or we can uh, suggest the router should actually use a data plane traffic to trigger neighbor discovery, for example. Right? If the router sees a data plane traffic flow for, from the address which it doesn't have a neighbor cache entry, it could start proactively resolution and so on. So there are various also could be done. So I think this should be published because it explains why we suggested exactly this mechanism and not something else. And actually those drafts to, to currently uh, problem statement draft refers to this one as a normative and this one has it as an informative reference because uh, I think it simplifies things. So the reference to each other. Okay, super. Uh, we have Warren uh, <laughs> first in the queue and then we have Fernando afterwards. Warren, please. Thank you, Warren Kamari. I just want to sort of reiterate that <clears throat> this problem was originally discussed at V6Ops. Uh, the issue was raised and V6Ops, the consensus seemed to be, well, that's a real issue. Let's try and fix it. Uh, no, actually, it looks like six man's the right place to do it. Um, so, you know, just a hint that six ops, uh, V6Ops seems very supportive of the problem. That's good, Dunan. Thanks a lot, uh, Warren. Uh, Fernando, please. Fernando, go. go. Um, I was um, going to say that uh, while reading this document, I should reread it, but um, I found that the other document of uh, in basic ops uh, was quite useful as a companion to this one. So it must be, it might be useful to do the two together, or at least even if we don't, I would like the basic ops one published too. Okay, good. Yeah, let's. Okay, so I think Bob and I will take an action then to to coordinate with uh, with V6Ops and uh, we'll take this to the mailing list as well, uh, obviously, but um, it, it sounds like we should go ahead and, and put this into working group last call. Yeah, I'll just add one thing to this. I mean, th there are lots of times in the ITF where developing requirements documents is very useful to figure out what we want to do, but they don't always get published because sometimes it's harder to get consensus on a requirements document than it is on the actual an actual solution. But we, we will certainly talk to the V6 ops chairs and figure out what they want to do. And Warren will get the last word on the no he withdrew yeah. the microphone line so then he will not then we'll move to the next presentation. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Um so Fernando you are up for um the 4941 BIS working group last calls status, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, good morning or afternoon or night or whatever applies to you. Um, so this is a presentation about the last update to the um, uh, 4941 BIS uh, document. Uh, next slide, please. So as a kind of uh, recollection of the recent history of uh, this document, uh, of course, it's a revision of 4941. Uh, we had a working group last call uh, starting on January uh, 9. And so this presentation tries to summarize the present comments and, and changes that have been applied to the, to the document. Uh, next slide. So um, one of the issues that uh, was raised and was uh, discussed on the mailing list uh, was about concerns about the possible impact of um, 
using multiple addresses or many addresses if you want. Uh, my sense of uh, what has been the outcome from the working group discussion is that this is an issue that uh, is not specific of uh, 4941, but it's a general issue of, of Slack. Essentially, uh, Slack is kind of like anarchy when it comes to uh, network configuration. So um, you don't really have much control uh, as to you know how many addresses um, each node configures. Uh, so it's not really specific to 4941, but um, still, um, you know, there was agreement that uh, the document should say something about this. Uh, so. Uh, in response to the discussions that we had on the mailing list, essentially we did uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, we included specific text on, on this stuff in section four. Um, the text was circulated on the mailing list and uh, well, was agreed upon with the folks that participated in the discussion at least. And another thing that we did was to uh, reduce the valid lifetime from previous value that was one month to, uh, sorry, one week, uh, not one month, from one uh, week to two days. And that effectively changes the number of uh, concurrent temporary addresses to two, okay, from the usual seven that you'd have with a valid lifetime of, of one week. Uh, next slide. Uh, then there was another question about whether um, temporary addresses should be enabled by default or not. If you look at uh, 4941, uh, it says that the use of temporary addresses should be disabled by default. Uh, it gives a number of um, uh, reasons for that. One is, you know, the applications that uh, might want long-lived connections and they fail. The addresses don't last for that long. And it also gives some mention about the possible impact on network elements. Um, what I read as the outcome from the working group discussion, obviously not everyone agreed on this, um, is that it would be a bad signal for the ITF to, to recommend disabling a mechanism that is in, in some way uh, meant to improve privacy. Um, and in support of this, I think we have um, essentially two VCPs. Uh, first one is on privacy moni monitoring and the second one is, in, is on uh, host address availability recommendations, which essentially already says that you know, uh, hosts should be allowed to, you know, to use uh, addresses. Um, aside from that, which is uh, recommendations that we have, um, even with uh, 4941 that um, recommended that, that temporary addresses should be disabled by default, uh, all popular IPv6 uh, host implementations that I know of um, enable temporary addresses by default. That's uh, different distributions of Linux, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, um, Windows, uh, etc. Uh, next slide. And then another one, uh, which, if I remember correctly, this is the last one. Uh, was um, there was some discussion about. Uh, extent to which temporary addresses help, help privacy. Well, 4941 itself was called privacy extensions uh, for IPv6 Slack. Um, the discussion on the working group, uh, or what I read from that, is that uh, temporary addresses help uh, address-based um, network activity correlation. Uh, talking about privacy, um, it's probably imprecise imprecise if you want, um, and I agree with that. Even uh, I have always thought myself that um, the name of the extension to call them privacy extensions probably wasn't the best possible title. Um, privacy addresses also you know, limit the time window um, during which host is exposed via, via an address that is exposed as, opposed, uh, as a result of um, active communication, meaning that you know, if somebody knows your address, for how long they can use that address to communicate with you. Obviously, with temporary addresses, they do have a lifetime. So, you know, eventually, even if your address becomes known, uh, at some point, it's not going to be usable anymore for that purpose. Um, and um, another thing that, you know, came out as a result of the discussions of the working group is that, um, you know, this is a revision of 4941. So, 
doing essentially is trying to address flaws, 49, 41. Um, so the, the question, if you know, if folks thought that um, you know, in, in the, that the privacy extensions or the temporary temporary address extensions, you know, were useless or or they don't add much, well, that would be subject, you know, for a different kind of work, like you know, different document that target to obsolete, for example, 49. So what we did in response to the um, uh, working group discussion. Um, first of all, we tried to change all, if or or if not most of the instances of yeah. of of the of the word privacy, and try to focus on what temporary addresses achieve. Um, and this uh, also includes the title. So rather than um, you know keeping the title privacy extensions mm -hmm. to IP6 Slack, uh, we changed it to temporary address extensions, which is more precise, I would say. Um, and we tried to clar clarify, you know, throughout the document, uh, whenever they are used, there was a use of the word privacy, uh, try to change it to temporary addresses and try to focus on what the document is, um, is doing. Because at times, you know, saying privacy might mean different things for different people. And I also send different spec, I also set different spec uh, expectations. So that's something that we did. Uh, next slide. So, um, in the last uh, one or two months, uh, we published uh, two revisions of this draft. Uh, revision 07 uh, was meant to address the working group last call comments. And if I remember correctly, the first uh, working group chairs revision. And we recently published uh, revision 08, which was uh, meant to, uh, to address the second working group uh, chairs review. Um, as authors, I guess um, our question is um, you know, if there are any further comments, and if not, uh, the document is uh, ready to ship for publication. Super, thank you, Fernando. Um, so uh, please join the microphone queue if you have any comments. I think the you know fundamental question here is you know do people feel that their uh, last call comments have been addressed? Um, sufficiently, and if if so, I, I believe this uh, should be ready to to ship. We'll uh, confirm that on the mailing list. But um, you know, this is your chance to uh, to come and and state if if you don't believe that's the case. Yeah, and I noticed there's some comments in the Jabber room. So if you could put yourself in the queue. So, Alexander, you uh, you are first, please. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, this is Alexander Petrescu. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to to be in the queue. And um, so, the, a, a very brief comment: uh, the is this privacy about uh, the address or about the interface ID? Question. You might be on mute, Fernando, if you, uh, at least we can't hear you if you're responding. Okay, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, so I will try to, you know, stay away from the word privacy. And I would say that, um, so first of all, this uh, document is about uh, addresses, not interface IDs. Uh, the two are related, but they are not, um, not they're not necessarily the, the same thing so um, this document is about the use of temporary addresses um, of course uh, the interface IDs are not predictable uh, otherwise you get privacy addresses if you want uh, but you know as I noted during the presentation I think it's better to you know, try to stay away from the word privacy because that means different things for different people. So I think it's, um, let's say, better to call these temporary addresses. What these addresses do is, or, or what this document does, is, you know, um, specify a mechanism that 
allows uh, implementations to produce temporary addresses, tem addresses that obviously have a, li a limited uh, lifetime. Um, okay, uh, that is supposed to help uh, with, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, base, uh, or address-based uh, network activity correlation uh, and other stuff, but um, I would prefer to not use the word privacy because I, I don't think it, um, it leads to more disagreement that, that it should. Um, yes, if I may reply, uh, thank you for the comment. Yes, the, indeed, privacy itself has many different interpretations and, uh, okay, so uh, my, my comment was uh, whether, uh, well, we, uh, this document has a mechanism to design uh, uh, privacy for IIDs, basically randomizing them. But uh, that is probably useless if uh, it's always the same prefix and it's always the uh, the prefix length 64. But uh, I know this comment is a, this uh, relationship to the PLN is a stretch. So uh, that that is all I wanted to, to say. Thank you for the... Thank you, Alexander. And, and, sorry, uh, th this was discussed and of course there are like, um, you know, even in the document itself, uh, it's noted that uh, it tends to help, uh, but uh, and it helps better in you know specific scenarios like you know if there are multiple systems on the same subnetwork. In any case, even if, for example, you have a single node in the same subnet, um, you always use the same um, interface identifier. Uh, then I can right away and without giving any further analysis, you know, assume that two different communications correspond to the same system. If I am changing the interface IDs, even if I am the only guy on the on the on the subnet, at least the guy you know doing the uh, network activity correlation has to do assumptions that, for example, in that case, I'm the only folk on the subnet. So it's not as you know as trivial or as right away as it would be without the temporary addresses. But anyway, as I said. Um, I think it's better to, you know, talk about this as what it does, like, you know, it, you know, it uh, specifies a mechanism for uh, producing temporary addresses, and as such, the consequences are, are, are these, or the implications are these, as opposed to talk about privacy, because that's a much broader topic, because that's what, um, you know, revision, the last revision, 08, um, has tried to address, and if, if you know, if I understood where it's coming from, I think that um, where some of the comments from Oli have to do. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, one more question from uh, uh, Logan. Uh, by the way, Fernando, can you come a little bit closer to the microphone and turn up your gain a little bit? Uh, that would be good. But Logan, please. Um, mine is more of a comment. Uh, I, I believe we should be ready to ship this uh, at once this document to the to our new AD. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Um, then Zafar, you are up uh, next to stand in the pink box. Please say next when you want me to advance the slides. Hi, can you hear me well? We can hear you well. Oh, great, thank you. So I'm going to cover SRV6 ONM updates, uh, basically uh, all the updates that are through uh, last call for this document um, on, my, on behalf of my authors, co-authors, as well as, next slide, please. Uh, contributors, next slide, please. So here's a bit of history of the draft. The work started almost uh, close to three years ago. Uh, there has been 11 uh, revision of the draft uh, since the individual submission. The working group call started on December 4, 2019. Um, we are using a GitHub where we've been posting incremental changes um, and communicating on the mailing list. Uh, there has been 30, 17 commits uh, to the GitHub repository during this. We uh, promoted uh, them in two different rounds, uh, one was version three, and then one was version four, where we took the last uh, repository and uh, posted uh, revision four. 
There has been active discussion on this draft on the mailing list. I would like to thank uh, all uh, the folks uh, uh, that have uh, contributed and have provided comments. Next slide, please. So, in the next uh, few slides, we are going to go over summary of comments and as well as what changes were made in the draft to address those comments. Um, so, first one is uh, we remove the TLV section. Uh, there were uh, comments uh, from uh, Ron Bonica, the first uh, um, mail in this uh, list. Uh, the next mail is uh, pointed to mail from Greg. And the third one is uh, pointed to mail uh, from uh, uh, Zen uh, Queen. And basically their question was that if uh, the draft doesn't have uh, a use case uh, illustration for TLV, then uh, why do we have this section? And authors agreed, and we removed the TLV section. The next comment was regarding illustration for O flag processing. So this is uh, like uh, some comments uh, that were around um, some clarification needed for the O flag processing. The first uh, in this list is a comment is a mail from Joel Harper. And the next one is um, um, a discussion that happened with uh, Greg. Um, and uh, what we did is we added uh, an illustration section for O flag processing that essentially illustrates and focuses on a controller based uh, passive ONM use case. Um, the illustration is created such that uh, we cover both node that support. O flag, as well as SRV6 nodes or endpoints that do not support O flag because O flag is optional, and also non SRV6 cable node that are on transit. So it is orchestrated such that we can make it clear uh, to the reader on our, how uh, O flag is to be used. Um, and then um, the next one is the ICMP error reporting section. That was a comment from uh, Zhang Queen. And the comment was this, that if there is no change to the base uh, ICMP v6, uh, then why is the, why, what is the point of uh, reporting it in this draft? So we removed that. Obviously, the draft relies on the base ICMP uh, v6 um uh, processing um as uh, as as uh, without any change uh so there was no need uh, as such and this section has been removed the next row is uh, really about uh, adding normative text uh, for the onm process that has been mentioned these comments uh, among other people there was comment from uh, Joel Harper uh, and Ron Bonica where they were asking for what happens. Um, we need some normative text on what happens when packet uh, is is given to uh, the ONM process. And uh, what we did is we added some normative text of that nature. Uh, the rest of the details are implementation specifics, uh, and we point that out as well in the draft really clearly. Um, and this is how we address these comments. The last row in this table is regarding the discussion that happened on the n.otp SID, where um, the reference is from um, email conversation with Joel Harper, Greg um, Meniski, and, and many others. Um, and the point was this again that. Since the draft does not have a uh, use case uh, uh, for this specified, it is better to move it to a place where the use case uh, would be specified. So we removed uh, the end or OTP uh, SID as, uh, as uh, to address that comment. And um, uh, next slide, please. 
So then now the next set of comments are mostly for clarification text that was needed and uh, were asked for. The first row here is on the scope of uh, O flag uh, for passive ONM. Essentially, there was a comment like how the passive ONM is, how the O flag is used, and there were confusion in terms of the scope and all. So we did clarify that all of that that passive O flag is used for passive ONM, and um, uh, that. Uh, lead to the next set of questions that um, uh, Greg and other has on the mailing list, is that what is the relationship of this passive ONM when it's in its queue ONM work uh, that is uh, going on? Um, and essentially, the, the point there was that we added text. In short, the point is that in its queue ONM carries the metadata that is related with the packet in um, uh, in the packet itself. So far, do you want to take a question? We have Joel and Greg uh, in the in the microphone queue. Okay. Do you prefer that we go over this and then we take question? Open the floor, or you prefer uh, we take it now? Well, if you well, why don't you finish this slide and then we go yeah, through? I think it may be better that I go over and then we take uh, question. Sure. So, uh, so we were on uh, the relationship between INS2 ONM and, and, and the passive ONM by OFLAG. And passive ONM by OFLAG is, is a controller-based ONM um, where copies of the packet is sent to a controller for correlation, where INS2 ONM is uh, a mechanism where uh, the ONM data actually go in the packet itself. Um, so that is the difference. And that, that, that has been very clearly clarified both through illustration as well as uh, through normative text or, or non-normative text. The next uh, set of question, which is the row number three here, is uh, there were discussion with, with respect to ONM consideration, if there is any uh, with PSP sets. And the answer to that was there is no special consideration needed to handle PSP sets. Um, and uh, this has been clarified on the mailing list. There was a discussion with uh, Joel Harper, Brian Carpenter, Greg, um, and others. Uh, so that clarification text is uh, now in the draft. Last but not the least on this list is uh, the uh, comment that we received from uh, Lou, uh, from uh, Lua Anderson. And that was about, uh, there was uh, clearly, um, missing uh, entry for INA consideration for OFLAC registry. Uh, that was uh, gladly added to the draft. Next slide, please. And then the next set of uh, questions are related with editorial changes. So, Lua Anderson provided a very detailed review uh, with approximately 36 comment. We have addressed all of them and those have been acted by Lua. There are two comments that are pending and they are listed as to be done item in the next slide. But many thanks Lua for uh, such a detailed review is, is greatly appreciated. Then we had a very detailed review from um, Zhang Kuang as well. And um, uh, these comments, uh, what, the comments were also in this review. It doesn't mean that they're only oratorial. Uh, there were other comments as well that are addressed um, as uh, either clarification tax or um, substantial changes. But here is that there were additional comments that were related with editorial changes, and those are addressed. And then the same apply with the uh, comments that we received from Ron Bonica, and they have uh, there were some editorial changes requested. Those changes have been made. There was a detailed review done by a, a, a Min. And those uh, uh, detailed reviews have been uh, responded back. Min has uh, responded back on the list on one pending item, and that would be addressed as well. There were uh, editorial comments in Greg uh, emails as well, and those comments have been addressed. Uh, there were editorial comments from Brian Carpenter 
as well and those are addressed there are other miscellaneous comments uh, as well from other folks and uh, and and they have been addressed this list is not uh, exhaustive next slide please so on the pending changes, like I mentioned, uh, Lua had a uh, detailed review with uh, 36 comments. There are two comments that are pending that will, um, that requires um, adding more substance to introduction and abstract. So they would be editorial in nature uh, and then changing notations uh, for interface addresses uh, that are used and that would be editorial in nature. Um, so we have, uh, I mean, we acknowledge that these two comments have been not addressed and we do plan to address them uh, very shortly. Then Bob, Bob uh, Hendon uh, kindly had uh, comments on the XML file, um, send priority to the author. Uh, and these are, again, issues with the XML file. We do acknowledge that we have not get chance to address those. Uh, them, but uh, we will address uh, them uh, gladly. They, none of these comments will require any substantial or normative change to the document. Next slide, please. Do you want to take questions on these ones now, uh, so far, before we move on to uh, those two last ones? Um, Joel Halpen, do you want to go first, please? Please. Um, you said that you had a Added illustrations of OBIT processing to address my comment. And you added illustrations, but that doesn't address my basic problem with the description of the OBIT processing. The description describes something that is entirely internal to the device and does not describe the actual behavior that must be performed. The description says, must make a copy, send to control with a timestamp. Well, that's not. That's not an external observable. That's not something we standardize at all. The question that you mu that the document needs to address is what does the router actually have to do with a packet that has the OBIT set? Sending control is not what the router actually has to do with the packet. Okay, so there is a pseudocode that is a normative um, need for what device supposed to do how device implement that is really an implementation matter we no, did the, add... the pseudocode no but but so far the pseudocode you have there is entirely about internal behavior it is not about what is the external result of the obit the external... you cannot require a device to make a copy of a packet because you can't tell if the device made a copy of the packet which is what the pseudocode says that's not an external observable. When a device do not normatively specify when, internal behavior. When a device advertises that it can support OBIT, there is externally known that it it will do this operation. That what it will, will it make do? a copy for telemetry operation. It will make a copy of the packet uh, for telemetry operation. Now how that's, that's not a meaningful I, thing to um, do. I have a real basic problem with this document because of this. Can I ask a question, Joel? Could you propose some text on the list how this could be resolved? Um, I actually do not know what they intend to do. This is really a case of I can't propose text because I do not know what the expected behavior is. Joel, the behavior look, described is not the externally observable behavior. Joel, look at uh, the illustration. The, uh, in, in the illustration is not the normative definition. I'm looking at 511, O-flag processing. One nice thing about this, I'm looking at it as we talk. It, you I say it illustrates it, but you haven't defined what the required behavior of the device is. So I think we have to make an internal operation. Is your, I mean, there is a pseudocode, which is a normative behavior. No, the pseudocode you have here is an entirely internal behavior. What is the external normative behavior? What is it that is required to be done externally visibly? There is also additional text on externally visible elements uh, uh, that talks about telemetry, the copy of this packet, which is externally visible. Uh, what is expected uh, from it? And uh, that gets complemented with the illustration. 
I think what would be good is if you can uh, have a look uh, on the illustration section, we'll be happy to have another call uh, as well with you uh, or discussion to give. I have looked at your illustrations that they do not tell me normatively what you expect the device to do. And I'm sorry, Bob, I understand that normally send text is the appropriate response. But when I don't know what the document is actually telling me to do, I have a problem and I have a very basic problem. My rule for this stuff is always, if this is approved as an RFC, is this something I can implement? I do not know what to tell my implementers to implement from this. Yeah, there, but there are implementers that have implemented this with this information. So, but I mean, oh. uh, so this has been implemented. Uh, so anyway, I think the point is that is okay we can uh, we are happy to uh, talk with you uh, even set up a webex call uh, to come uh, to a text uh, explain and then come to an understanding of what you are expecting because what is not clear to us is what you are expecting beyond above and beyond what is in the document we have external behavior we have uh, internal pseudo code we have illustration let's let's work together to see how we can um, document it to a service. Does that sound like I'm a good happy point? to talk to you further, but I had raised this multiple times and you have not dealt with it. Fine. We I, I do not think it can progress until this is solved. This is very, very basic to the function of the document. That is it sounds like this is something we have to take uh, to the list. I, I mean if there are other people who who also you know see Joel's point it, it, i'm sure it would be helpful if they could also try to express it you know differently so we can see um you know so we can get some help uh, figuring out you know what's missing here in the description of the old flag but, but i think we have to take it uh, to the list um, i'm happy to take it to the list i'm happy to have web uh, conversation by phone or webex or whatever yeah because let's do that the illustrations do not resolve the problem I, I mean, the author would be really happy with to work with you on this. So, so we have Greg and, and Ron in the in the microphone queue. Uh, Greg Mursky, uh, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I apologize, I, I didn't get a chance to read the latest uh, version, so I cannot uh, say uh, what this is. Uh, I want to uh, make uh, two comments. Uh, first. I think that your interpretation of um, OEM classification based on RFC 7799 and O flag as a passive OEM uh, is incorrect. Uh, because you're using this and you're modifying the packet, so it would be a hybrid OEM. Uh, second, I still believe that uh, what you try to achieve with the O bit is achievable <clears throat> uh, with their uh, current uh, IOM or in situ OEM because um, the work on in situ OEM continues in IPPM working group and currently now we have what's called as direct export uh, function which uh, achieves the same thing uh, that you try to uh, make happen uh, with the old flag, as I understand. So I would still want to discuss, continue our discussion on uh, what's the difference between uh, using old flag and uh, using IOM uh, approach. And I would appreciate to be a part of a discussion on the topic that uh, Joel brought up, because I do have my concerns there as well. Uh, again before their uh, new text but i'll read the text and i'll comment to the list so that's probably it yeah so uh first of all greg many thanks um so regarding whether uh, this is uh, really a passive um onm or or, or a hybrid uh we, we can definitely talk this is terminology i uh, think um one way or the other the point regarding how it is differ from um, uh, any of the IO, IONM work. So here the motivation is to get uh, these uh, data from uh, only segment endpoints because these are the nodes that are very well suited for information of their very well suited points in the network for uh, traffic engineering. So 
uh, rather than overburdening network with all the information, they provide key information. So, um, so that is uh, that is uh, one uh, aspect that we can um, we can certainly talk a little bit more with you uh, on this, uh, Greg, um, and uh, we will set up a call uh, as well, like that we discussed the normative text that we talked about with Joel as well with you and uh, address uh, your comment. Thank you. And uh, and we have Ron in the queue. Could you have the, uh, the last uh, word, please, Ron? Okay. Quick question about pinging a SID. Let me make sure I understand the mechanism correctly. Say for a minute, you're not pinging. You're just sending a packet to a SID, and the packet traverses the IGP lease block. You just send an IPv6 packet. Destination addresses that SID. Uh, there's no SRH involved at all. Now you decide that you want to ping the SID. So you would have to include an SRH so that the first um, SID in the path would be the end OT and the second one would be the singular SID you're pinging. Do I have that right? Uh, yes, go ahead. What's bothering me is that the data plane traffic has no SRH in it and the uh, OAM traffic has an SRH in it. The presence of the SRH may actually change the result. For instance, if somebody's filtering uh, packets with extension headers, the ping won't get through when in fact the data packet will. Yes, I, I think that's a, that's a fair comment, uh, Ron. Um, How do we fix this? We we need to. I think we we'll, we we'll take this comment. This was not raised in the list uh, uh, prior. Um, we will take this comment and uh, we will uh, contact you. Okay. You can on the mailing list or or we are taking notes here. Uh, we will for sure uh, come back to this. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Ron. Okay, so far that was the microphone queue. So um, we, uh, if you want to run quickly through the rest of the slide, that would be great. We're a little short yeah. from this one. So, uh, so essentially, uh, uh, with respect to the um, deployment implementation interoperability, there are uh, six known deployments uh, of the draft in production network, um, and uh, there are additional and disclosed deployment. Uh, there are implementation status as well that is noted. Um, in the deployment draft, which is mentioned as a source on this uh, page. Uh, so you can have a look on all the deployments uh, for this draft because it just talk about this, but there are platform that have shipping code uh, with this, uh, uh, this in including, uh, uh, including uh, OFLAG. Uh, now, in, with respect to interoperability, they were uh, interop done at e EANTC. Uh, in 2019, uh, there was uh, as, as well a multi vendor interop done in MPS World Congress um, or, or show, showcased at World Trade M Congress. And uh, there are authors are aware of us uh, interoperability testing between uh, vendors uh, that were privately done. So all this information is publicly disclosed um, except the private details uh, on the SRVC department uh, status file. Next slide, please. So uh, we will, as we mentioned, we will address all the pending comments, the comment discussion that happened today. Um, and um, uh, we would like uh, folks to review uh, revision force, uh, send any additional comments on the mailing list, or you can reach us. Uh, and um, one question for the chairs is that, uh, maybe it's a good opportunity to to explain to uh, the group uh, the expected unit of the good hub uh, because that's what we've been using um, uh, but uh, it would be good to get that clarified because I think there was some confusion uh, during the use of github um, both from authors as well as from the working group right so uh, yeah this is all so I, I was the one who been trying to push for the use of GitHub here. 
with, with somewhat mixed results. The intention was for to focus uh, the working group more on the document itself and actual text changes. Um, so what I you know was hoping was that the people, the reviewers would put in pull requests for individual issues as they found them. Um, those pull requests in GitHub would then gather a consensus or not, and then the document shepherd would press the, you know, the commit button uh, on those changes, just like we do with source code. Um, and then if there were the discussions on the issues themselves uh, would be happen on the mailing list, you could have that discussion on GitHub as well. But um, I think, you know, it, it sort of discussions quickly diverge from from sort of the text itself. So you know. It, it seemed like they would do better on the mailing list, but um, it has been, you know, so far, I don't think we have seen any pull requests. So, so, you know, so this is sort of back to the ITF mantra of proposed text. If you want changes, proposed text. And, and if you have text, please do them as pull requests. But but that's pretty much as, as far as it goes. And it is an experiment. You, you're free to propose text in, in the mailing list with all the new as we have done you're marking them as old and new as we have done in the past as well. Um, uh, yeah, that that's pretty much it. it. Was it anything else you uh, want the clarification on so far? No, 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 that sounds good uh, to me. Um, uh, we've been, we found that uh, uh, uploading uh, a version on GitHub for incremental changes is, is, is very efficient. So I, I think that's from the experience that would be the feedback um and uh, we'll continue to use it um and and uh, because it's always yeah this change has been addressed in github have a look at there and, and then we can promote a few version uh, on timely basis so i think it is i mean the hope was it was really that we sort of built like you know working group consensus around each pull requests and committed that and and you know by the end of it it would be no sort of unresolved issues when a new revision came out and everyone was aware of what changes were made. I don't think we've quite gotten to that point yet, um, but but at least the, we sort of, you know, experimenting with the tool to see if it does help us as a group of people trying to do sort of collaborative editing on a document, uh, but we'll see. But thanks a lot uh, so far for the- Thank you very much. Update, I think we need a new revision, right? That That's at least, uh, at least clear. Um, so this finishes the, uh, working group uh, documents. The next one is um, EPI on uh, the IPv6 application of the alternate marking method. That's a uh, individual document. Uh, Giuseppe, are you ready? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you well. Go. Uh, okay, good. Uh, yeah. Hello, everybody. This is Giuseppe. I'm one of the co-author of this draft. This is an update of the IPv6 um, application for the alternate marking method. Okay, next. Um, yeah, just to give a quick recap uh, about the methodology. So uh, maybe, uh, I don't know how many people is already familiar with this methodology. I hope most of the folks. Uh, anyway, the alternate marking methodology is a NOAM performance measurement technique. In particular, it can be classified as hybrid or also passive, depending on point of view. Um, the reference documents are FC 8321 and also the multipoint alt mark draft that is in RFC editor Q. Uh, so the basic idea is to batch the packets by switching the value of a single bit. In this way, we can group the packets and count the packet loss along uh, the path. And um, in addition to packet loss, it's possible to measure also the delay. Um, in particular, in single marking uh, methodology, we can measure first and last packet delay of a group of packets or also average delay. If we want more informative packet delay metrics, we it's better to use a second bit for marking. So it's uh, the suggested and the most suitable uh, way is to use two bit, so the so-called double marking. Next. 
Yeah, what about IPv6? So why, why we are proposing this draft? Uh, the main requirement for the application of this methodology is the marking field. So since we need a marking field, we have to identify uh, it. And uh, in particular, we already worked on a draft that analyzed the, differ the different alternatives for uh, the marking field. And in the end, the, um, the best choice uh, was the use of the, an option header that can be both of by op or destination, depending on which kind of performance measurement we want to enable. Um, in summary, the alternate marking application is very straightforward and seem very simple because it does not affect the packet behavior. Uh, just the source node, only the source node uh, writes the option header to mark alternatively the flow. And both the intermediate nodes and the ending nodes may be configured to support this option header or not, but this does not impact the traffic and uh, the measurement. Since the measurement can be done only for the nodes that have this option enabled, while for the other nodes, simply the metric is not done, but nothing happened. Uh, uh, in the end, the alternate marking methods allow both or by open end to end measurement. So, next. Um, yeah, uh, the, the better way to apply this methodology is to generalize the alternate marking data fields. And uh, so, a new TLD, we want to introduce this new TLD to be encoded in the, an option header. Uh, we follow the option header format. And uh, you can see the red box, the generalized data fields. So we add to the two marking fields, the, L, the loss bit and the, the delay bit. We add also um, a flow monitor, a flow monitoring identification. This is requirement. This is required for some general reason and for deployment experience. In particular, the, this flow identification helps to reduce the per node configuration, so uh, helps to reduce, for example, the number of access list on the router that we need to serve um, the flow. Uh, it simplifies also the counter handling, especially in tunneling and so on, so to avoid the packet inspection to find the right encapsulation and so on. Um, and also it eases the data export and the collect. Uh, while we also identify the first three bit of the option type, uh, because as, um, as also I mentioned before, we need three zero values because the, this option can be skipped if it not recognized and data don't change and root only the source node uh, set the marking bits. Next. Okay, um, as encapsulation header option, we can, we can have different alternatives that we can evaluate. For example, if we use this option header as destination option, the measurement can be done only by the node in destination address. As op by op option is the, the best way because every router on the path with this feature enabled can make the measurement. There is also, we also mentioned the option of the SRH TLV, but in this case, every node that is an entry in the SRH, in the SR path can be, can do the measurement. And the same behavior can be, can be obtained with the destination option together with the SRH. In this case, also every node uh, that is an entity can make the measurement. Anyway, we clarified also after some discussion on the mailing list, we clarified that the usage of the SRH TLV is still under discussion within the community. So it's not the preferred solution for now. Uh, and in general, hop by hop and destination option are the most suitable ways to implement alternate marking because it's valid for IPv6 in general, including also the um, subcase of the SRH. So next. from the 01 version. So we got um, several comments on mailing list from Bob, Bull, Tom, Stefan, and Ryan. And thanks 
for raising the discussion. And, uh, as I said, these fruitful feedbacks help to clarify better the scope of our draft to help to analyze how to encode the TLD uh, for alternate marking application, also adjust the wording somewhere and uh, update the references. Uh, we also added the definition of three high order bits of the option type in the very last version and um, a new co-author has joined, maybe some less some version before. So I think we are uh, uh, next slide will be the last one. Yeah, as a next step, yeah, we we think that we have found an agreed way to apply alternate marking uh, and also its extension that uh, is uh, in RFC Editor Q. Uh, and the authors considered the draft ready for working group adoption. So anyway, um, we are open to questions, comments, and. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, Eric, uh, no, sorry, Ron, you are uh, first in the queue. Okay, first, I do think this is an interesting experiment. I'd like to note a couple things. First, it's based upon RFC 8321 and uh, the draft OEM Alton Art Rules, both experimental or, uh, or informational or uh, experimental. Ron, you're, you're dropping a, a bit, at least from my side. Would you try to be sorry in the microphone and speak up a bit? Sorry. Thank you. I'll be a little, little louder. Um, both of these uh, documents that this draft is based on are experimental or um, uh, targeted for experimental. Um, another thing is there are some security issues that remain to be worked out. I think it might be a good idea to progress this document as experimental, and at least for the time uh, being, as experimental code points for the uh, option identifiers. Regarding, yeah, regarding the, your first point, yeah, uh, you are right. Both are C8321 and uh, multipoint Altmark draft are experimental. Uh, there was also some discussion, in particular during the AD review of the multipoint altmark draft, uh, about the scope. The uh, media um, suggest to change into informational, but anyway, experimental and informational, nothing changed. So we can consider borderline between experimental and informational, but anyway. Um, Would be interesting. Regarding... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and um, anyway, this is not the uh, main uh, the main purpose here. So the idea is to, uh, because uh, both RFC 8321 and multipoint mark draft uh, are more focused on the methodology that is general. So if you want to make, um, uh, since to apply this methodology, we need space in the packet header, uh, we cannot make FEC 321 and uh, the other one and the multipoint draft as standards because we cannot standardize, standardize nothing because we are just talking about a methodology that is transport agnostic. So it can be applied to IPv6, to beer. We also have a draft in beer that is standard track because it applied the RFC 8321 to the beer, to the multicast traffic. And it is following the standard track because in that case, in the beer, we are asking for two bits to implement and to encode the alternate marking um, application. And it is basically the same thing that we're trying to do with IPv6. So we aim to define bits and also mm, we have defined and generalized field to encode the alternate marking application and to make it standard in order to go beyond the experimental that is ex the experiment that is described in the RFC 8321. So this is the, um, just to explain you the motivation. It's not clear to me that that experiment has concluded yet. Would you be averse to using experimental code points until it concludes? It's, it's not an experimental code. So 
the the methodology is, is I think is uh, already completed. I mean, the um, the basic methodology is already completed and it is uh, applicable if you uh, if you look at uh, both RFC 321 and also the new coming RFC. Uh, it's, it's well completed from all the point of view because it investigated all the aspect of the, the deployability of these methodologies. But the only things that we need to deploy is the space in the packet header. Otherwise, uh, we cannot we cannot uh, deploy um, this methodology. There are already experimental deployments both in uh, Telecom Italia network and uh, also as Huawei product, and also in other product um, that are presented that are already uh, de deployed. But anyway, to make it applicable and standard, we need to, to follow the standard track, in my opinion, uh, in order to clearly define the field that can be used to apply these methods. Okay, thanks for that, uh, Giuseppe. Um, that's a discussion. I think we have to continue uh, the status on this document and uh, on the list. Um, I have Eric Vank and then Eric Klein. Eric, please go. Thank you, Ole. This is Eric Vank here without any um, hat here. First, Giuseppe, uh, thank you so much for the document. Uh, as a side note, I really wonder whether it's really not a waste to spend a complete extension header just to con transport two bits, but okay, uh, side apart. I really wonder my real question is about using the hop by hop extension header in this case. Uh, typically measurement, my understanding, are done end to end. And in order, if you're using hop by hop, it means that every route on the path will have to have a huge amount of scalability issue because it needs to remember all those measurements compared to the end to end. And I'm pretty sure as well that you know that hop by hop extension headers are still quite drop a lot over the internet. This header is a little bit better on this. Any comments on this? Yes. Yes, yes. Um yeah, I, I know that hop by hop options is not um is not we can say recommended. But uh, um, in RFC in ATT in 8200, um, it is also stated that uh, in case there is a strong motivation for the usage of a biop, um, it can be defined. But a part of that, you can consider that the hop by the intermediate nodes uh, don't need to. Um, need to read the option option header and um, so they don't need to handle or modify the content of the option header so maybe this can be easily managed by the router um, instead of other kind of option header when you have to put information in this case you just need uh, to read the marking that is set by the source node. So this. But even if you read, it means that the the CPU sees it, Giuseppe. And, and again, uh, that's version dash zero one. So that's open for discussion. Of course, we may want to continue this on the list, but just pay attention on this. And again, good work. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank and, you, uh, Eric Klein. You get the last word on this draft. Uh, thank you, Eric Klein. Uh, no hats. Sort of similar to. Uh, Eric's comment. Uh, actually, I was wondering with respect to hop by hop uh, or a hop by hop versus destination option, whether or not there was value in having both that you might uh, use destination for sort of just end to end measurements. And you might, if you say wanted to do something across, uh, across your own network, if you were running a multi continent uh, wide uh, backbone network uh, and you wanted to trial some stuff, you could use the hop by hop options. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, it's correct. Both options. Yeah, 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 it's correct because the scope of the draft is to define the general TLV, the general option that can be encoded 
bot as a by op and also with the destination option of course yeah and also i also mentioned the case of hdrv but it will be made in the future if it will be used uh, but for now we can focus on bot op by op and destination option of course yeah, yeah i guess that there was i was um trying there's lots of text about hop by hop or destination and it was not clear um if you were attempting to choose just one or uh uh Leaving the option open yeah. for having the, the same same format for both yeah, I mean, both options. Yeah, the idea is to to leave the choice to the the implementers. Maybe it's better. Maybe also if the draft uh, will be adopted, we can continue the analysis and together with the working group to understand what are the limitations for each kind of deployment and so on. So that is the idea to. For now, to leave both options open for the implementation, and uh, then we'll see. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, Giuseppe. Um, Fred Templin, please step up in the pink box. Uh, yes, I'm on now. Do you hear me? Okay. We hear you perfectly fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this is a document titled Transmission of IPv6 Packets over Overlay Multilink Network or Omni Interfaces. Uh, let's go to the next chart, please. So uh, in terms of agenda for this talk, I'm gonna give some background and motivation. The mobile node mobility service architecture model, the Omni interface model itself. I'll be discussing about the maximum transmission unit link local addresses, a new option called the Omni option, router discovery and registration, the conceptual multi-link selection algorithm, and then state the document in the next Let's go to the next chart. Okay, background. The International Civil Aviation Organization is designing a worldwide IPv6-based aeronautical telecommunications network with Internet Protocol Services. It's going to be known as the AT-IPS. Each aircraft mobile node is assigned a unique mobile network prefix from an aggregated mobility service prefix by the Mobility Service Prefix Authority. Uh, for example, IKEA would be the authority for the mobility service prefix for the AT-IPS. So if the MSP is a slash 32, then slash 56 MNPs can be assigned and then the aircraft acts as a mobile IPv6 network. Uh, aircraft that connect to the ATNIPS via multiple air-to-ground wireless data links, and these data links often have diverse properties. Some examples are VDL Mode 2, LDAX, SAC, Aeromax, and there will be others. So we need an air-to-ground interface for multi-link coordination, and that's what this document is about. And again, the document is titled Transmission of IPv6 Packets over Overlay Multilink Network Interfaces. Uh, we've received, received substantial review input both from uh, the ICAO working groups and from IETF uh, members, and they've resulted in significant improvements. Uh, and the draft has been reissued with alignment to the six-man working group. And members of the ICAO Communications Panel Working Group by Mobility Subgroup have issued a four action liaison statement on 329 request and standards track publication. Next chart, please. Okay, now I wanna talk about the overall architecture for mobile nodes in the ATN IPS. So on the right diagram, you see a block of, the, of a mobile node in the upper portion of the diagram, and it has multiple access network link connections. Uh, over those access network link connections, the mobile node sends native IPv6 packets, and they are received by an access router that connects that access network to the rest of the global worldwide uh, aeronautical telecommunications network. So we have native IPv6 packets on the, the access network interfaces. The access router serves a proxy between um, the access network and the global internet or internet work. So the access router performs encapsulation on its INET interfaces on behalf of the mobile network acting as a proxy. 
um, within the mobility service that the, the uh, worldwide interconnected inner network, there are mobility service endpoints that support distributed mobility management. In, in particular, each mobility service endpoint tracks a subset of all mobile networks in the global INET. Okay, let's go to the next chart. And what I wanna do now is to look in more detail at the architecture of this mobile node that we had in the previous diagram. The mobile node has a virtual interface known as the Omni interface. And that's the mobile node's virtual interface connection con configured over multiple diverse underlying ANET interfaces. Um, so the, again, they would be SATCOM, LDAX, Aramax would be examples of these, uh, these interfaces. The Omni interface assigns an IPv6 uh, link local address known as the Omni link local address, and that's used for neighbor discovery messaging. Um, and the access network interfaces are unnumbered interfaces underneath the, 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 uh, the Omni interface. So there's no IP assi address assigned to the connected access network interfaces. And the Omni interface is the mobile node's logical attachment to what's known as the Omni link, which per observes the non-broadcast modal access link model. The Omni link incorporates the mobility service and spans the worldwide inner network. Again, in this case, the ATN IPS for, uh, for air traffic management. Next chart, please. Okay, maximum transmission unit. We are saying that the Omni interface maximum transmission unit is 9,180 bytes. That number came for RFC 2492, but there was a string of earlier RFCs where that number was motivated from, and that's the number that we're going to be using for the Omni interface. So only the Omni interface MTU is exposed to the IPv6 layer, while the underlying ANET interfaces may have a wide variety of diverse MTUs that could be smaller than 9180, for example, 1280, 1400, 1500, et cetera. The traditional approach the, when, the, when an IPv6 packet comes into the Omni interface, it would drop the packet that was too large for a selected underlying inter, inter interface and return an internally generated packet too big. Uh, but we want to do better than that. So we have a new approach where within the Omni interface, we'll perform link local RFC 2473 encapsulation, IPv6 and IPv6 encapsulation, then apply IPv6 fragmentation to the ANET interface MTU size, the link local destination then gets to reassembly, and it can optionally return advisory packet too bigs if reassembly becomes problematic. This provides us with lossless path MTU discovery. The source is going to dynamically adjust to any advisory packet too big messages with no loss, and it supports sizes up to 9KB gigabit Ethernet Jumbo frames across any access network link type. So the number of 9180 is not the size of the physical data link units underneath. What it is is the size that the receiver needs to be able to reassemble. Next chart, please. So the Omni interface assigns Omni link local addresses. And the way that we form link local addresses for the Omni interface is that we take the aircraft's mobile network prefix, or the mobile node's mobile network prefix, and we embed the, the prefix within the interface ID of the link local prefix FE80 colon colon slash 64. So for example, for the mobile network prefix 2001 db 8 2000 the corresponding OmniLink local address is FE80 colon colon 2001 db 8 uh, Omni compatible mobile node uh, IPv6 compa IPv4 compatible M M mobile node Omni LLAs are assigned from FE80 colon colon FFFF colon V4 adder. So, for example, for IPv4 address 192.0.2.1, the Omni link local address is FE80 colon colon FFFF 192.0.1.2.1. .1 so that's for mobile nodes. The mobility service assigns link local addresses from the prefix FE80 colon slash 96. So those addresses would be FE80 colon colon 1, 2, 3, et cetera, up to FEFFFFFF. The IPv6 link local subnet router anycast 
address is already defined in RFC 4291 as FE80 colon colon. So that's, that's used as defined in RFC 4291. And we reserve a block of future use addresses, uh, FE80 colon FFFF through all Fs. So this is under the assumption of the slash 64 prefix length. If the IPv6 addressing architecture changes to permit future prefix lengths of 65 or longer, the Omni link local address format is going to be able to accommodate up to slash 118. So that provides us future proofing in case we get to the point where we have prefixes longer than slash 64. Next chart, please. Now the Omni interface is going to be using a new IPv6 neighbor discovery uh, option type called the Omni option. It's going to appear in IPv6 neighbor discovery messages. Uh, we need a new type to be defined by IANA. And the Omni option header includes a prefix length and R flag to be used for source address based prefix registration. So for example, in an RS message, if the source address was FE80 colon colon 2001DB812, again, this would be a, uh, an Omnilink local address. If the prefix length was 56 and R1 meaning to register, then the mobility service will register the mobile, mobile network prefix 2001DB812 slash 56 in the routing system. We can think of this as a stripped down version of prefix delegation because all we're trying to do is register the prefix in the routing system. Since the mobile node already knows its prefix, all it's asking to do is for the mo mobile mobility service to register the prefix in the routing system. And then within the Omni option, there is a list of sub options that follows that has multi-link and mobility service parameters. And you can see below the format of the sub options and the currently defined sub options that we have, pad one, pad n. I've indexed two bolts of two different types, mobility service register and mobility service release. Next chart, please. So the Omni option includes what we call IF index tuples. And there's type one and type two IF index tuples. Both types include an IF index that identifies the underlying access network interface an IF type, which is the type of the ANET interface, um, very similar to the way IF index and IF type are used in, in network management. Uh, provider ID is set to the access network service provider. And then we have a link quality metric with one being the lowest, 15 being the highest. Zero means that the link is down. Type one IF index tuples include a vector of two bit preference values. Uh, preference values 0 through 63 correspond to the 64 IP differentiated service code points. Uh, P64 and above are additional traffic selectors. They could be based on application port numbers, uh, IP address ranges, et cetera. And each P value includes a, a two bit value, 321, meaning high, medium, or lower disabled, for this particular IF index. And then we have a type 2. Uh, IF index tuple, which includes an RFC 6088 format traffic selector. And this could be used for flow binding encodings and IPv6 neighbor discovery messages without record requiring adjunct mobility messages. Next chart, please. So then router discovery prefix registration using the Omni interface. What happens is that the mobile node will send router solicitation messages with Omni options. And they'll be sent over individual ANET interfaces that are configured underneath the Omni interface. When the access router receives the router solicitation, it notices the Omni option and then coordinates with the mobility service. The access router then returns router advertisements with the Omni option and any auto configuration information that would normally delivered, be delivered in a solicited router advertisement message. So what the mobile node does is it sends initial router solicitations to register its mobile network prefix and an initial set of up ANET interfaces. So for example, if the VDL mode 2 is up, you send a router solicitation over the VDL mode 2. If the SATCOM is up, you send a router solicitation message over the, the, the SATCOM, et cetera. 
So the RS messages are sent from within the Omni interface over an up underline any other interface, and the process is coordinated from within the Omni interface, and it's opaque to the IPv6 layer. So all this is going on below the IPv6 layer. The access router processes the RS message and conveys the Omni option information to the mobility service. The mobility service injects the mobile network prefix into the routing system, caches the prefix length and mobile network prefix and IFA index tuples, and then the mobile mobility service directs the access router to return the router advertisement message to the mobile node, uh, again with an Omni option and with uh, non-zero router lifetime if the prefix registration was successful, otherwise zero. The mobile node receives the RE confirmation, and then the access router will be set to forward packets between the mobile node and the mobility service. Next chart, please. Next chart, please. Thank you. So after the initial registration, when an ANA Phase transitions to up, the mobile node sends an Omni RS message. When an interface transitions to down, the mobile node can send an unsolicited neighbor advertisement message over any up ANET interfaces with an IF index tuple for the down interface with link set to zero. So, for example, if my VDL mode 2 goes down, I send a UNA over the SATCOM, the mobility service gets it and then takes the, the VDL mode 2 link out of its selection process for, for, uh, for traffic selection. Uh, the mobile node departs from a current mobility service endpoint. It can send an RS or UNA over any up inter, in -in interface to release that mobility service endpoint. When the mobility mo mobile node uh, associates with the new mobility service endpoint, it sends a RS or RA over any up interface to, with a mobility service register. Um, now, one thing that's interesting about this is that with when we have multiple mobility service endpoints servicing the same mobile node, the RS or an RA message can, can include multiple register IDs in a single RS message. So I could send a single RS message over, for example, my VDL mode 2 link, and it would register with me with multiple mobility service endpoints with a single message. And that's, that, that amounts to a very large saving of messages over low data rate access network links. Um, so then finally, when all the mobile, mobile nodes underlying interfaces have transitioned to down, or if the prefix re registration lifetime is expired, the mobility service withdraws the mobile network prefix from the routing system. Next chart, please. So now that all of this has been set up because okay. of all the RSRA messaging. Right. Um, um, can yes. you, we're sort of running out of time here. I wonder if you could go to the next slide and then Cer allow for some certainly. discussion. Certainly, we can skip ahead to that one. Thanks, Mom. Thanks. So, so really what we need to talk about now is the status of this document and next steps. Uh, this document has been uh, a work in progress in working group by the mobility subgroup of ICAO since March of 2019, and it's now published as an IETF internet draft. Uh, there's the draft name. We have code that's an advanced stage of development and testing in Linux-based network emulations and early aviation testbed trials, uh, also other relevant trials such as uh, enterprise network mobile devices. And in our liaison statement, we've requested the IETF to adopt the work uh, it's an example of an IPv6 over foo spec. It uses a new IPv6 neighbor discovery option known as the Omni option that needs to be standardized. And it uses a new link local address format known as the Omni, Omni link local address format. And we're requesting standards track RFC uh, uh, publication. Uh, so for what we're asking from six man is for additional review input and uh, if co-authors would be interested. Uh, and also asking six man to adopt the work as a six man working group item. And now I'll break for questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have one question from Alexander. Alexander, please go. Um, yes, uh, hello, Fred. Uh, how are you? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I have uh, several uh, questions. Some are more detailed, some are high level. High level. 
and <clears throat> I have put them in the Jabber for reference. I suspect there is not enough time to discuss them all now, but um, this um, LLA uh, the LLA uh, format or Omni on on the Omni interface looks like a link local address that integrates in its uh, interface ID part the mobile network prefix. And an example is given on slide number seven with um, a mobile network prefix uh, that fits well because uh, it has a prefix of um, maximum four hexets or you said 56 bit. And, but uh, it's, it is a good thing. It is not a 64, <laughs> so it is 56, but um, yeah, could, could the mobile network prefix also could be, could it be uh, uh, more like uh, more than 64, for example, five hexets? So, uh, Alexander, what we've done is we've said that for prefix lengths up to slash 64, those prefix bits will go into the the 64-bit interface identifier of FE80 colon colon slash 64. For prefix lengths longer than 64, the additional prefix bits would begin to be encoded in bits 10 through 63 of the IPv6 link local address. So what this allows us to do is in the future, if we were going to allow prefixes longer than 64, those prefix bits would appear in bits 10 through 63. Since the uh, ad addressing architecture has FEA 0 colon colon slash 10, that allows us to encode up to a slash 118 prefix. Okay, perfect, thank you very much. That's all from me. Eric Klein, you're next, and then we have uh, Esther Silva last, and then we have to move on. Uh, Eric, please. Uh, yeah, Eric Klein. No, no hats. Th thank you, Fred. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, okay, let's set aside FE80 colon colon slash 10, because I think there are some issues there, right? By convention, it's 60, this is less 64 that's available on the link, but um, I guess you're going to say this is different for this particular link. But I, I had a question about, like, if we set aside the MTU uh reassembly the mtu uh the link specific variable mtu and reassembly issue uh is there any reason this couldn't just be a regular router with the slash 56 assigned to internal addresses and doing link local communications on each link uh moving moving this forwarding plane from interface to interface to interface separately so you're asking whether the the virtual interface model can be lifted and just expose the underlying access network interfaces to the IPv6 layer instead. Is that your question? Assuming the MTU reassembly uh, issue could be punted to the to the lower layer, yeah. So there are slides uh, beyond my backups here that I think we have time to go into, Eric. I'd like to ask you to go to those charts and look at what they're they're talking about in terms of the uh, advantages and the rationale for having the virtual interface. Uh, some of the points that will be included there are things like the fact that you don't have to get uh, uh, care of addresses, if you will, uh, the access network interfaces if you use the virtual interface. So that means that since you don't need to get, well, I, I'm, I'm going to be going into an exhaustive list if I start, but I'd like to direct you to those charts and if you could take the discussion to the mailing list on that. Because there was some, some, plus some of this was uh, being able to register connectivity over links uh, where you, like on slide 11, where you would seem to lose some fate sharing. But, you know, there's no, there's no, like you, you seem to, seem to indicate that you could register connectivity over links without actually sending packets over them. Um, but there's a certain fate sharing about being able to, <laughs> to make sure the link is up that you can communicate over it and register by it. But I, I'm perhaps I, I, like I said, I'll, I'll read them. I'll, I'll read your backup slides and I'll, I'll uh, reread, I'll read it up. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Esther Silva, please state your name and uh, you're next and last in the queue. Thank you. Thanks, Ali Salo, from my queue, actually. Uh, just a question, Fred. Uh, it's a simple question, actually. Is uh, what is the relationship between the Omni interface and the existing mobility solutions like uh, MIPv6 or LISP? Do you have anything about that? So uh, I, I think the background about our discussions in IKO are not widely known to the IETF, Sala, but I'll just mention that we are looking at multiple mobility service solutions 
for the aeronautical telecommunications network within, within our protocol service. And two that you mentioned are, are two of the solutions that are being proposed. But the Omni interface is intended to be and is generic to whatever the mobility solution would happen to be that is chosen for the ATN IPS. It's strictly the air to ground interface and the mobility solution would then be triggered by the air to ground interface messaging. Uh, and there's not any favoritism given to any of the mobility solution candidates. This is meant to be a generic interface. Thanks, Ray. Bob, do you want to say something more on this draft before we uh, move on? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so I think this is all very interesting. I'm pleased to see this work being, you know, brought to the ITF. I think there's a lot of work, you know, the liaison is sort of a work in progress at the moment. Um, but I, the one thing that I would like personally like to see is that some more just, or at least more justification, understand why there's a lot of things here, which are not well beyond an IPv6 over FUSPEC. Um, it's proposing new ND options, you know, a bunch of things. And I, I'd like to see more justification for why those things are necessary. Why it's sort of, I think to Eric's question, why, um, why can't IPv6 just be used as currently defined? What, you know, what is the benefit here? It's, it's adding a lot of complexity. I realize this is for a particular subdomain, um, but I, I think there's going to need to be a lot of discussion over some of these issues, but we, we will do that on the list. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Fred. Um, we are 7 minutes before our ending time. Uh, if people don't mind running a little over, uh, we might do that. Uh, Fernando has asked to swap uh, his last 2 slides. I think is that correct? Fernando you want this 1 first. No, 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 no. Just um, hi, Oli. Um, keep the the other one. What I meant is that if we run out of time, I prefer to do this one with you know appropriate time, and just postpone the other one so that we don't just don't rush. Let's uh, let's try and see if we we can do both. We'll see how much time this one takes, and and we'll decide. And if... okay, cool. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is a presentation about uh, improving the reaction of uh, IPv6 uh, Slack to flash renumbering events. Uh, this is a topic that um, has been discussed a lot, uh, both on the six-man mailing list and on the v 6 ops uh, mailing list. Uh, next slide. Um, so essentially, there are a lot of um, you know different scenarios. Uh, some are more common than, than others. Um, in which uh, you might have a host connected to a network and all out of the sudden uh, network configuration uh, changes or you know somehow the router just vanishes. On the left hand side we have a very common scenario in which we have a CPE router that is doing a prefix delegation with the ISP and at the same time is uh, doing Slack on the, um, on the home network. And one of the scenarios that might happen and that is common is that, for example, the CPE router crashes, reboots, and it gets a different prefix list from the ISP. In most uh, cases, the CPE router just, it just uh, doesn't uh, record on stable storage the prefix that was leased before. So when the router uh, reboots, it has no knowledge of the you know, previous prefix that uh, was leased. Uh, it starts advertising a new prefix on the local network and uh, all the nodes on the local network, all the hosts, uh, keep the stale information. There are many different scenarios in which this kind of thing can happen. Uh, as I have mentioned on the six month mailing list, um, we have a B6 Ops uh, working group item, item that discusses the problem in detail. So this presentation and the, and the correspondent draft they focus on the protocol updates that will be necessary uh, to improve um, Slack's uh, response to renumbering events. But the, the problem statement and the problem itself is discussed in detail in a um, basic SOPS working group item. Uh, next slide. 
So, um, when considering, um, you know, protocol updates that um, would be necessary or would be valuable to, um, you know, improve the reaction of Slack to renumbering events, there are a number of things that, um, or a number of aspects that are uh, interesting to, um, to consider. Um, first one is about signaling. Uh, for example, we have two options in some scenarios. Uh, the router itself um, uh, that trigger the renumbering event um, continuous operation. It may be aware of the stale information or, may, or it might be unaware of the stale information. For example, in one case, uh, the router crashes, reboots, but the uh, router uh, had stored on stable storage the information about the prefix being announced. So the router reboot it, uh, it now got a different prefix list from the ISP, but it's aware that the information has changed. So it's somehow in the position of trying to deprecate that information. In other cases, the router might be unaware of the stale information. That would be the case, for example, if the router reboots, gets a list, a different, a different prefix, but the router uh, doesn't record on stable storage. Uh, prefixes that are leased by the ISP. In other cases, we could have, for example, the router just disappear. For example, the router just crashed, or for example, um, a switchboard was moved uh, to a different VLAN. Um, so we had a router that was advertising information and just, you know, that router somehow disappear, whether because the router itself disappeared or because, for example, as I mentioned, a switchboard was moved to a different villain. Another thing to consider is uh, where we might, um, um, you know, apply improvements. So you can apply improvements on the host side or on the router side. Um, if you apply the router, the, the improvements on the, on the host side, then that means that uh, in order for hosts to benefit from these improvements, don't need for the routers to be updated, and that's of, or, or, um, that's of course valuable. On the other hand, uh, you know, if we apply improvements on the router side, that means that even if we have uh, host implementations that have not been updated and improved, then they can nevertheless uh, react that way in a time layer way to um, to these renumbering events. So what our draft tries to do is to pursue improvements in all of these areas, um, both on the host side and also on the router side. But we think that the, the host, side, host side improvements are particularly valuable because, you know, as soon as you implement them, then uh, no matter whether the routers have been updated or not, they can already react that way to these uh, renewables. Uh, next slide. So, um, I'll try to um, summarize uh, the improvements that we are proposing in these uh, uh, few slides. So, if you look at um, the current specification for Slack, um, it uh, specifies a preferred lifetime for prefix information options uh, of one week. The slide says one day, but that's incorrect. So the current default preferred lifetime is of one week, and the default valid lifetime is of one month. Um, of course, that's the equivalent of setting timers that uh, will never go off in any meaningful time. Okay. So what our document proposes is, on one hand, to uh, change the default lifetime for prefix information options. Uh, and routers, uh, and uh, select or set the uh, this lifetime as a function of the router lifetime. Uh, currently, what we propose is to um, set the preferred lifetime of prefix information options to the router lifetime, and set the valid lifetime as a function of that. If I remember correctly, um, we set it to n times the router lifetime, and we currently set n to 48. That means um, that with the default uh, default value for the router lifetime, we'll use a preferred lifetime of half an hour, and we'd use a valid lifetime of a day. Okay, so 
we reduce the preferred lifetime, lifetime from one week uh, to half an hour, and we reduce the valid lifetime from one month to one day. On the other hand, we also propose to cap the received lifetime at host. Of course, this is useful when your host is connected to a network and the, and the uh, local router is still using the, uh, the default values currently specified in RFC 4861, um, if I remember correctly. So we, uh, our document proposes to cap the preferred lifetime, the router lifetime, and cap the valid lifetime to n multiply for the router lifetime. Currently, that would mean um, capping the valid lifetime to one day. That means if the advertised uh, lifetimes are longer than that, then we reduce those lifetimes. This means, for example, when it comes to the host uh, side improvement, that even if the router, for example, disappears, the host can recover in a layer manner. Uh, next slide. Um, there is another issue. If uh, you look at section 5.5.3 item E of RFC 4861, uh, it essentially prevents um, the valid lifetime in a PIO from reducing uh, the valid lifetime associated with the corresponding addresses to anything smaller than two hours. That means uh, that if you, receive, if you receive, for example, a PIO with a valid lifetime of, of zero, uh, the receiving host is um, expected to ignore that uh, PIO. Um, this is, if I understand correctly, uh, this was specified in this way for security reasons, but, um, you know, from our point of view, um, it doesn't make much uh, sense to just... Uh, and these PI or, or just or to specify the PIOs to be ignored, because you know from the point of view of, an, of uh, from the point of view of an attacker, if an attacker wanted to you know uh, just implement, um, uh, for example, a denial of service attack, it has like a zillion other attack vectors, like for example, flood hosts with bogus uh, PIOs or road information. Uh, spoof router advertisements with a lifetime of zero, so the you know the router itself is disabled, etc., etc., etc. So from our point of view, um, it boils down to you know either you implement first hop security or you don't, uh, because if you don't, uh, the attacker has so many different attackers that uh, you know it will it, it has other options other than you know sending PIOs with a valid lifetime of zero. And on the other hand, if uh, you prevent hosts from reacting to PIOs that have a valid lifetime smaller than two hours, uh, then you prevent um, like a time layer a reaction to renumbering events in situations in which the router, the local router, is aware that you know network configuration information. Uh, next slide. And uh, finally, uh, we also specify a couple of alternative algorithms. They are meant to do the same thing. So I'm just going to describe one of them, but the other one is very, very similar. And uh, the idea is um, uh, for host to actually try to infer uh, when um, network configuration information has, ch has changed. For example, this would be the scenario in which, for example, a, a router crashes boots, it gets a different prefix list from the ISP and starts advertising this new prefix. Now, if the router has not recorded um, the previous prefix on stable storage, it will start um, announcing a new prefix for um, auto configuration, but obviously at the same time, it will cease advertising the previous prefix. prefix. So the idea is simple. From the host uh, point of view, you see that the same router that was advertising a previous prefix has ceased advertising that, that prefix and has started advertising a new prefix that should be taken as an indication that network configuration information has changed. So what we do is essentially 
uh, try to implement that, like try to um, deprecate the stale uh, prefixes, uh, open receipt of uh, router advertisements from the uh, same router, but uh, RAs that cease to advertise, cease to advertise the previous prefixes. And as a kind of improvement to the algorithm, we try to unfold the processing of uh, ULAs and the process of ULAs and the processes of uh, uh, global prefixes. So what the algorithm does is this. You receive um, a router advertisement from the same router as before, the router that was advertising a previous prefix. The RA advertises a new prefix, but it, it the previous uh, prefix, then what you do is you reduce the uh, preferred lifetime and the valid lifetime for that previous prefix. What we currently do is reduce the preferred lifetime in the order of a few seconds just to accommodate the theoretical scenario in which um, the configuration information might be split into multiple router advertisements. And uh, we reduce the valid lifetime, if I remember correctly, uh, we uh, reduce it to an, um, to the order of um, about half an hour or maybe even, uh, obviously the, the valid lifetime is reduced to much longer. And we do the same thing for ULAs. If you receive a prefix that is advertising a ULA, but it doesn't advertise the previous ULA, then you reduce the preferred lifetime and the valid lifetimes accordingly. Um, at the same time, if uh, the prefix was being advertised by multiple routers, uh, then you essentially disassociate this prefix with this specific router. We are talking here about uh, the cases where uh, we are having uh, scenarios where the network is using multiple prefixes. And in summary, um, you know, this uh, algorithm is able to deprecate prefixes when a new prefix is being offered by the same router, but the same router is not, has ceased to advertise the same prefix. Put another way, if the same router from which we got the configuration information is now advertising a different prefix, and it's not advertising the previous one. We try to reduce the lifetime values so that uh, these prefixes get deprecated in a more in a time layer uh, manner. Um, next slide. Implementations. Um, so lately, we have been working in uh, on implementations of uh, these things. Um, we did implementations for a number of uh, daemons which are used in different operating systems. Um, so this uh, slide tries to summarize um, existing implementations. When it comes to um, reducing the lifetime values that are employed by uh, router implementations, uh, we implemented this in different um, daemons. Their RAD is the daemon employed by OpenBSD. RADBD, which is the um, uh, daemon employee in Linux normally, and uh, we have an ongoing implementation uh, for RTADB, which is the daemon employee for um, FreeBSD. So, Fernando, I, since we're running over, I wonder if we should start on the microphone queue now. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. At the end of the day, there are multiple implementations of this. Uh, they are summarized in this slide. So, please uh, yeah. move on. Fantastic. So we have Jen, Philip, and the Eric. Uh, Jen, do you want to start? Uh, you wanted. Uh, uh, I wanted uh, not the previous one. I guess about lifetime equal router lifetime. Yes. Yeah, so sorry, I have the properly read the uh, latest version of the draft, but. Does it mean if I am dragging one of my routers and the router advertises zero lifetime, uh, the PIO will get zero preferred lifetime and zero valid lifetime, it will get immediately uh, deprecated and became invalid, which might be actually very undesirable behavior. If your router is the only router that is advertising this prefix, yeah, that would be the case. 
Okay, so if two routers advertise the same prefix and the host is getting an array with zero router lifetime, you're still not de deprecating the prefix, right? Exactly. So, but does it mean like the router will be advertising the preferred lifetime of zero in the PIO? Um, that would mean by default. So what we did, for example, in the implementations that we have, is if you are not setting the preferred lifetime explicitly, yeah, the, the default is should be to advertise the same lifetime as you do for the uh, router lifetime. Yeah, I think it's kind of dangerous for default behavior. Let's say I have a router, I have two routers, and I'm going to drain one, and I did not specify explicitly lifetime in configuration. So now the first router advertise it will put zero PIO preferred lifetime. Will, which will indicate to host, oh, please deprecate the prefix. I think you should be very careful about dealing with zero lifetime in arrays, in zero router lifetime in arrays. What router shell put there? Okay, okay. I mean, to be honest, um, I'm not sure if we had, consig uh, con uh, we had considered that specific case, but uh, I mean, point taken, and we'll take this into account into the next revision. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, Philip. Okay, so <clears throat> first a general comment. I think this is an important thing that should be solved and certainly changes uh, on the host uh, would help to, to solve this quickly because it will take forever for all the routers to get updated. Um, the thing that has me worried about is, is the inferring stale information thing. Um, it seems that uh, the algorithms that uh, Fernando um, is uh, working on are fragile, are not reactive. Um, since I introduced uh, an issue with if you alternate uh, normal global user, uh, unique address in ULAs, uh, now the algorithm has become more complex because it has to do separate processing for ULAs. Um, but even then, it's it's not clear if we should build in just one type of ULA into a host and then later be stuck if we want to have another ULA-like concept and then find out that it's going to fail. Um, so I think that that part of, of the draft really needs a lot of work and uh, needs a different way of approaching those algorithms um, because this doesn't seem to work to me. So that's my comment. Thanks, thanks a lot, Philip. I think that's a very important, very important comment. We have to ensure that we um, end up with not the less robust um, protocol coming out of this. I think we should, you know, all work together and, and thoroughly look at at the protocol implications here. So thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so you have the Eric's. So Belgian Eric first. Oh, and and by the way, the. WebEx was scheduled to end at 45 minutes after the hour. I'm not sure what will happen. We will find out in about a minute. So if it dies, it dies. Okay. So WebEx will cut me off. Okay. Um, hello, Fernando. This is Eric Vank here. Uh, also on slide six, it's typical for route advertisement to be sent multiple times by the router because all the messages and all the options in the route advertisement can be longer than a single array. So it could be common that one PIO is sent in route advertisement one and another PIO is sent in route advertisement number two. So different route advertisement from the same router. Furthermore, there's also the possibility that, and it's quite common nowadays, that unsolicited multicasted arrays are not sent every minute or so. They are sent much longer, I meaning that the frequency is much higher simply because we want to reduce the numbers of multicast array. So basically the assumption where you buy this with algorithm is maybe need to be reviewed, right? PIO are sent differently, but from the same routers in different arrays and array frequency as much uh, lower than you expect. Um, actually, the, the two algorithms uh, do consider this. Like, uh, for example, both algorithms consider like um, all of the options might not be uh, included in the same uh, message. Uh, that's why, for mm -hmm. example, in this algorithm that is uh, described in this slide, we don't uh, set the preferred lifetime uh, to zero right away. 
but we set it to, in this case, uh, to five seconds because we are assuming that if the router is splitting the information into multiple arrays, then that time of five seconds accounts for uh, the receipt of those different arrays, for example. But in this case, in the case of the multicast array, you can miss it over Wi-Fi. There's another issue. Right, multicast uh, over Wi-Fi, you are lost. Uh, that's correct, and um, there are two things. Like essentially, uh, you can accommodate for you know uh, to those cases by uh, setting uh, these two values. Uh, you know the the uh, the preferred lifetime that you set the PIO to, and the uh, lifetime that you set the the value lifetime you set to. Uh, so. In this case, you could say that the five seconds is more aggressive. Now, if you wanted to accommodate, for example, to to other cases, like you know when uh, the options are split into multiple uh, messages and the packets are lost, etc., 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 these uh, lifetimes could be increased. Okay, and then kind of defeating the purpose of your draft. Anyway, we need to work on this. That's basically my point. Just if, if you are aware about this, no more multicast and PIO send from the same route and different arrays, uh, then we can work on this further. I would say that I, I check myself and I also um, I uh, I check with team and I haven't seen myself any case where they are actually uh, sent in multiple different arrays. Um, Again, obviously there is a trade-off uh, if you can react more aggressively but if or, it's... or not. Yeah, but my understanding is that your draft is basically a host behavior, not a router behavior. Well, so you for... cannot infer. Wait, whatever, we, we want to yeah. okay. go offline. I think we have um, one last comment from Richard uh, Patterson. Please go and then we'll end. on the same topic really uh i think um i was going to reiterate um fernando's uh i guess uh beyond how the the pios are generally seen in the same ra but it, whilst it is supported it could be in separate ones um but also we could look at um triggering router solicits perhaps including um the pio option in the solicit as a bit more of a uh, i guess a reactive approach as opposed to just decrementing the timers. Something to look at, maybe. Yeah. We definitely have to continue this on the on the list, I think, and, and do you know some thorough reviews and discussions on this. I think that has been very useful. Uh Bob, do you want to see the say the uh, uh yeah, we will we run our time so we skip Fernando's second sessions. We have to do that on the mailing list. But but Bob, do you want to see say the farewells and summary? Uh, yes, so thank you. Yeah, so thanks for everyone for joining. Um, Oli and I will talk about whether we want to schedule a second interim meeting. Um, I think this generally worked pretty well. Um, we could do the talk we didn't get to today, and then there were some other things we had queued up for IETF 107 that obviously haven't happened. So we'll we'll be back in touch on that. Um, I think the WebEx in general worked pretty well. So wish you all, um, everyone be safe and well. Um, we're living through some very interesting times that I think we'll all remember for a long time. So thank you very much and take care. And next time we'll promise to do a hum. Thank you guys. <laughs> take care everyone. Okay, bye. <laughs>